All right, so we're almost done with uh, second order circuits uh, in the time domain. And now we're going to kind of discuss um, just sort of some loose ends, and, uh, and then we'll start to basically migrate to the next chapter, which is uh, AC analysis, right? That's sort of the whole point of circuits two, is you learn what happens when your inputs um, are basically sine waves. And sine waves turn out to be pretty important, so um, we're going to spend a lot of time on them and studying how to analyze them and use them and so on. So let's summarize a whole bunch of stuff you already know. Um, the first thing you already know is that we've been looking at the circuit. We discovered the circuit has two basic modes of operation. Uh, the first basic mode of operation is when the damping ratio is greater than one. And the second mode of operation was the damping ratio is less than one. When the damping ratio is greater than one, um, all, all of our step responses basically just look like decaying exponentials like they did with a first order system. When our damping ratio was less than one, uh, all of our responses looked like uh, decaying uh, sine waves. Right? So that was the. Um, so, for example, in its current configuration, if I hit simulate, You can see that my step response is a decaying cosine, right? It's still decaying to its final value of one. Um, we, what else did we figure out? Oh, we figured out that the, um, the frequency of oscillation was, uh, was set by the term omega naught, and that omega naught was equal uh, to the square root of one over LC. And we also reasoned that that made some degree of intuitive sense because the natural frequency of the system uh, has to do with the ability of the inductor and the capacitor to slosh information back and forth to each other. We figured that the damping ratio was basically set by the resistor. And the bigger the resistor is, the more energy gets lost as with each pass of the energy. So if you make the resistor bigger, you decay faster. Um, so did I get chalk today? Of course, it's back here. Um, so I believe where we left off was that, um, so we said that the, our, uh, our roots, uh, S1 and S2, were going to be at, um, and help me out if I get this wrong, it was, um, was it minus zeta omega naught? Minus zeta omega naught plus or minus J root 1 minus Oh, sorry, j omega naught. I'm doing this from memory, so feel free to tell me if I get it wrong. I believe it's j omega naught root 1 minus zeta squared. Is that right? Good. And I argued that uh, the minus, that this term here, that set the terms of the decaying exponential. So, um, and then this term here, so the, fir the real term is basically your e to the st, uh, which you can also think of as e to the minus t over tau. So we can use that term. That term basically sets the, the time constant of the decay. And this term over here, because it's imaginary, that's the frequency of oscillation. Okay, which is basically, this is a little correction factor, but it's basically just omega naught. So this is the imaginary portion. Cool. All right. Oh, and I believe, oh, I, the, I think the one thing that we weren't quite sure about on um, Monday, we were trying to, um, the, the, the time constants weren't quite matching the simulation. Isn't that right? Like they were close, but they weren't perfect. And I think I figured out what was going on there. Um, it turned out I just had to change the time step a little bit. Um, let see if I get all these. Like, don't fall asleep, please. Oh, don't, don't, don't. <laughs> I used to fall asleep all the time in school. It's okay. I turned out okay. 
Um, <coughs> right. So I think all I had to do to, to, so basically the argument was, um, so in this particular case, let's see if I can, um, uh, let's see, hide. Uh, I guess I should pull up my spreadsheet, huh? <coughs> Uh, let's see, lecture, day two. Oh, come on. Not right now. Okay, so for the example we're doing, I've got a resistor of two. So for the resistor of two, uh, we were expecting a time constant of two milliseconds. which meant 63% decay in two, um, in two milliseconds. So if I run that analysis again, um, so my rationale was that um, you're going to take your initial value and you should get 63% of the way to your final value. So we said if our initial value was um, zeros one. Okay, so our initial value is something like um, like one point nine. Like that point up there is one point nine. We were arguing that so it starts at zero. It went right up to one point nine. We know the final value has to be one. So we figured after one time constant, you should have decayed down to 63% of your final value. So the calculation I did was 1.9 minus 1. That's the total distance we're going to decay. After one time constant, I should have decayed about 63% of that. And then, so that's the total distance I should have gone down by. So if I do 1.9 minus that value, that should give me my final value at about one millisecond. And that was the calculation we did. So on Monday, the simulation wasn't quite working out. Um, I'm prepared today to try that again. So if we do 1.9 minus 1.9 minus 1 times 0.63, I get 1.33. So after two milliseconds, I should be about, oh, seriously, it still doesn't work? No, 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 no. Hold on, hide. Oh, this worked in my office. Oh, run. Maybe that'll help. So after two milliseconds, I am, ah, rats. Okay, this must not be my lucky day. This is like the second fail I've had in two lectures. Okay, well, let's sort of push that to the side. That's not going to change today's lecture. It should work. I think what we're, the reason it's not working is more of an artifact of the simulation uh, than it is with the actual math. I think our math is solid. I went and double-checked the math, and I was pretty content with it. Um, so isn't it one time constant for 63%? Yeah. Right, and that's the calculation I did, right? So the total distance it has to decay, it's going to start at 1.9 and end at 1. So that means as a total distance it has to go 0.9. And in one time constant, it's going to decay 63% of that. Okay, so it's going to travel 63% of that. So if you take 63% of 0.9, you get... You take 63%, you get 0.567. So that means you should have gotten 63%. That, so that's this distance is, is 0.567. So if you do 1.9 minus 0.567, you wind up at 1.33. And that's why I was expecting to see it there. Didn't quite work out, um, so I guess once again I'm gonna have to go back to the drawing board. But I don't want to worry about that right now. So questions? 
So that's like mostly a summary of where we've been. Okay, so I want to do two things today. The first thing I want to do is to, um, is to look at these poles. And I want to draw them. So, like right now, with this particular simulation that we've done with, um, with resistors 2 ohms, um, it looks like... Um, So for this particular calculation, I've got zeta equals, I'm just going to copy down what's on the spreadsheet, right? I've got zeta is point oh, oh point, should we call it 0 0.016, where the box is. And omega naught equals 31.6K. You with me? So what I want to do is I want to make a plot. This is a very common plot that we're going to get used to making. So it's got, this is basically like how you plot complex numbers. So you show a real axis and an imaginary axis. So I've got two poles. I want to show where those two poles are on this plot. So let's look at my first pole. My first pole is going to be at minus zeta omega naught. So can somebody figure that out for me? What is minus zeta omega naught? With your calculators out in your hands, my engineers. Come on. I guess I can do it from here. They're right there on the board. Right there. There's zeta, there's omega naught. If you'd like, I can come write them in your notebook. Minus zeta, oops, I'm in the wrong book. Okay, M equals minus zeta times omega naught. Oh, I'm getting a uh, minus 500, is that right? So my first pole is at minus 500 plus. Now I've got to still do the J part, don't I? So it's going to be equal to omega naught times the square root of 1 minus zeta squared Blah. I did the square root, right? You got to get right. Okay, so uh, thir so basically it's the same thing, 31.6K. So plus J, 31.6K. Cool. Where's my other pole? What's the real part of my S2 pole? Is it the same thing? Right, because instead of it being minus j omega plus, sorry, instead of minus zeta omega plus, it'll be minus zeta omega <coughs> minus. But the zeta omega part stays, stays the same. So minus 500 minus j 31.6k. So here's what I'm going to do. Um, I am going to go over here to minus 500 and then I'm going to go up here to 31.6k and I'm going to put an X because that's where one of my roots is. See what I've done? Where's my other one go? Down here. Uh, all right. So there's your minus 500 minus 31.6K. Okay, whatever. So, what do you think I'm going to do next?
What I want to do now is I'm going to vary my resistor. I'm going to vary my resistor, and I'm going to see what happens to these, these roots. OK? So I'm actually, what I'm going to do is I'm going to make a new, um, this, this spreadsheet's getting pretty clogged up. So I'm going to add a new page to it. So resistor, inductor, capacitor. Um, actually, I can, OK. So resistor, inductor, capacitor, zeta, omega naught. And then um, we'll just say uh, real part, imaginary part, or we'll say how this plus imaginary part and minus imaginary parts. Okay, so resistor is two, inductor uh, two. Yo, it was just two. Inductor was two millihenries. Capacitor was half a microfarad. So zeta is always equal to, oh, we did zeta, uh, omega naught first, right? Omega naught is always equal to 1 over the square root of L times C. Oh, I can't do that, can I? L times C. And zeta is always equal to uh, R, was it R over L? Divided by 2 omega naught. Yeah, that's the same value of zeta we were just getting on the previous page, right? 0 0.0158. 0 0.01, there you go. There's your 0 0.0158. So I'm basically just repeating what we already have on the other spreadsheet. I'm just kind of condensing it a little bit so I can make a neat plot. So therefore, my real part is going to be equal to um, minus zeta omega naught my positive pole, my positive root, imaginary root is going to be omega naught times square root of 1 minus zeta squared. And this will just be the minus of that. All right. Now, let me populate it. So let's do, um, let's do some other resistances, right? 5, uh, 10, 20. Do you remember, what was the resistor that made it? Stop ringing. Was it about 100? Okay. So let's just fill in these values. We may fill in more. Okay, so what I'm going to do now is I'm going to create a plot. Charts, scatter, just the dots will be fine. Okay, now let me make that graph intelligible to you. Just give me a second to think what I'm doing. Okay, so... Well, let's add a few more points in here. I don't think we got quite to where we needed to be. 1.2, okay, 50, let's add a 75, see where that gets us. So we got, let's see, did we get the 75? We did. Let's go 100. Hundred and fifty. So I'm basically just adding a bunch of resistances. Ah! Okay. So here's my poles. My roots. So basically all I've done... I've taken this process that I was doing of drawing my those little X's to show where the roots were, and all I'm doing is I'm extending it for, um, I just tried more different resistances. More different. There's some good English for you. Um, so I tried it with um, 
with very low resistances, and then I made my resistances bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. So what's going on here? What happens as my, as my resistances get bigger? Yeah, let's try, um, let me just put in like one or two more lines. Does that help? I'm just trying to fill it out with a few more values. So it looks like what's happening is, for very low resistances, I'm over here. As my resistances get bigger and bigger and bigger, my poles start to, my roots start to drift down towards the x-axis. But they're always complex. Okay? So, I have, we said when we have zeta is less than 1, I'm trying to sort of connect all the dots in this puzzle for you. So. So we said that when um, zeta is between 0 and 1, we always have a step response that looks like a decaying exponential, right? And we said the, the time constant of decay, right, the, the time constant of decay should be uh, 1 over zeta omega naught. So in other words, as zeta gets closer and closer to zero, it takes longer and longer for your thing to decay, and it gets more and more, like it basically just won't decay anymore. And that's what happens over here. This is when zeta was, that's when my resistance was very small, right? That's when I did two. That's what that came out to, minus, that was like the really small number. So here's my, I have my very smallest resistance, and also my very smallest Zeta. It doesn't decay over here. Okay, so that's where my signal basically just just barely, barely ever decays. What do you think would happen if you made zeta equal to zero? What would happen if you zeroed out that resistor? Would the signal ever decay? No. If you took out that resistor, all you'd have is an inductor and a capacitor that just kept sloshing energy back and forth with no decay whatsoever. So. In the limit, when r goes to 0, then you have zeta equals 0, and you have no decay. Right? Basically, an infinite time constant. That, that, that ringing that you see will just last forever. Um, supposing it were somehow possible, so this is the uh, real axis. This is the imaginary axis. So it looks like. As, my, as my, 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 my roots get closer and closer to this axis, the ringing gets worse and worse and worse. Is ringing good? Is that something you want in a system? It sort of depends. Okay, sometimes you might want it, sometimes you might not want it. It's definitely a mark of an unstable system, though, and that's kind of the point that I want to make. Um, if... Um, let me erase this. So low zetas bring you closer to this axis. So let me kind of represent this over here. So this is your real axis, your imaginary axis. And so you can almost imagine kind of like a line where your roots are. Okay, so your roots are always somewhere along that line. When you make zeta smaller, the roots go in this direction. When you make zeta larger, the roots go in this direction. When you make zeta smaller, your step response, so let's say your, your envelope looks like that. If you make zeta smaller, what happens to your envelope? 
Does it decay more decay or less decay? If zeta is smaller, less decay. So if you make zeta smaller, so this is zeta smaller, okay, versus if you made zeta bigger, it would decay faster, okay? So those are all the pieces of the puzzle that we're trying to fit together. So your zeta kind of sets how fast it decays. And if you were ever able to get zeta right here with zeta equals zero, your system would never decay. You'd basically just get a, a sloshing cosine forever. What happens if you manage to get your, your roots over here somehow? Pretend. Yes! <laughs> you can actually do this, right? And when you get to control systems, maybe in like two semesters, Okay, so you see how everything so far has been on the left half side of, the, of this axis? We call this the left hand plane. That's an awful, awful handwriting. That's the left hand plane. If you're on the left hand plane, your system is stable, okay? Meaning that, meaning that if you put in a step response, eventually your system will will settle out and you'll get, you'll get a constant uh, response. But look at the pattern. As I make my zeta smaller and smaller, my ringing gets worse and worse until finally it never decays. Were you to somehow bust on through to the right-hand plane, instead of your system decaying, it would get, that's like the opposite of a decay, right? It would get bigger. So the, we say that the right half plane is unstable. So there you go. Just something to think about before you get to, you might see this if you read around different stuff. But in order to have a stable system, you always want the roots of the system to be, to be negative. That provides decay. OK. So here we said this was zeta equals 0. We made zeta bigger and bigger and bigger. What do you think zeta equals right there? 1. Zeta equals 1. When you get to zeta equals 1, the system stops oscillating anymore. It doesn't ring anymore. It's now moved from what we call underdamped. So these are sort of like the, um, the magical catch raises. That's an underdamped system. And then when zeta gets to 1, it's critically damped. And then after that, let's see what happens for some other value. Okay, so um, let me um, let me pop back here to um, our original spreadsheet for let's say a resistance of um, okay. So if I have a resistance of 150, which is just after zeta passes through one, so for resistance of 150. My value of zeta is just a touch bigger than 1. And my two roots are at minus 17,000 something and minus 57,000. So here's minus 15,000 something and here's minus 17,000 something, or whatever it was. Okay. The, uh, the point being that when you have complex roots, you have, you're underdamped and your system oscillates. Then when you get to zeta equals 1, you move into a new mode of operation. Now instead of having complex roots, you have two real roots, and your system doesn't, is, doesn't ring anymore. Now it's overdamped. So if we put the pieces together, we can say the following. Let me just pull up the screen real quick, because I need the space. So when zeta is between 0 and 1, we say the system is underdamped, which means that the step response oscillates. And we also notice that 
for smaller zeta, it oscillates, um, or well, let's say, for smaller zeta, it, there, it decays more slowly. It decays slower. And it also means that you have complex, complex roots of the characteristic equation. Remember, S is the roots of the characteristic equation. You have complex roots. So complex roots equals underdamped equals oscillating response. Then right when zeta gets to 1, the system becomes critically damped. And then after that, we say it is overdamped. An overdamped system does not oscillate. Meaning that if you were to look at its step response, it would look something like, like what we saw before, where it basically just doesn't oscillate, right? It basically just has a decaying exponential vibe to it. And uh, what was the deal with zeta? If we continue to make zeta bigger, if we make zeta bigger, does it decay more fast or less fast? That's a weird way to ask that question. Let's see. If we make zeta bigger, does that mean a bigger resistor or a smaller resistor? I don't know. Can we figure it out? Do we have that technology? Remember our characteristic equation was S squared plus R over L S plus 1 over L C, which we said was equal to S squared plus 2 zeta omega naught S plus omega naught squared, right? Therefore, we said omega naught equals 1 over root L C. Therefore, zeta has to equal R over L divided by 1 over 2 omega naught. So 1 over 2 omega naught. And if omega naught, if 1 over omega naught is the same as root LC. And now it's just ugly. Uh, it looks like it's R root C over L. Yeah, that's probably the easiest way to do it. R root L over C over 2 is your zeta, right? You don't have to guess. That's ugly. So if R, if, if R gets bigger, zeta gets bigger, right? So this means that R, if you make your resistor bigger, you make your zeta get bigger. If you make your resistor get bigger, what happens to your time constant? Is it going to... Is it going to rise faster or slower? Does a bigger resistor mean it's impeding the flow of, like a bigger resistor makes it harder to charge something, right? It's, it's like a bigger, it's resisting your ability to charge that capacitor. It's resisting your ability to charge that inductor. So if I make my resistor bigger, I'm, making, I'm resisting my ability to charge this. So it actually gets slower. Okay, so as your zeta gets bigger, it, um, it takes longer to charge. We looked at this already, right? Remember we started making our resistor smaller and smaller and smaller? And we found that as our resistor got smaller and smaller and smaller, eventually it got so small that it, it, it did like that. And then it overshot, and that's when, we started, that's when we got into our complex poles. So yeah, bigger resistor is going to make it charge slower. Okay, this will always happen with real roots of 
your complex equation of your uh, characteristic equation S. Yes, sir. What about increasing capacitance? Again. Okay, that's a good question. If I increase my capacitance, according to this, what happens to zeta? This is zeta equals this nonsense. So if capacitance gets bigger, zeta gets smaller. So if capacitance gets bigger, zeta gets smaller. That means the time constant it charges faster. I can't believe that that equation actually works. That's amazing. R over L equals 2 zeta omega naught. R, hold on. R over L equals 2. Did I screw this up? Why don't you say something? Yeah, I'm like looking at this and thinking this doesn't make any sense. Zeta equals R root LC over L. No, it is right. Why you got to mess with me like that? Oh, the two. Yeah, yeah. Right, and then you can rewrite that to look like that. Right, because... L is root L times root L. So one of those root L's cancels this root L, and you're left with root L over root C. There you go. So it is right. Okay, it does make sense. Don't mess with me like that. Okay. So you're designing a system. All right. Do you want it to be underdamped? Do you want it to be overdamped? Kind of depends, right? Like... Um, one nice thing about an overdamped, uh, about an underdamped system, like so, let's say you're trying to make something that, um, let's say you're trying to charge a battery on a cell phone, like you're designing a charging system for for your your cell phone. All right. So, an underdamped system might charge. The charge might look like this as a function of time. So it's going to take some amount of time to charge the system, right? Now, if you're designing this, you want it to charge as quickly as possible, don't you? Right? I mean, so maybe we could change some parameters, and instead of having it charge like that, we could have it charge like that. That looks like it's better, doesn't it? Doesn't that charge faster? So that's good. Um, what if I charged it like this? Is that better or worse? Does it charge faster? Yes, yes. yes, absolutely, right? So when we move from an underdamped system, sorry, from an overdamped system to an underdamped system, it's cool, right? It got to our target faster. It's a faster charge. At what price? So is it, I mean, should I, should I under damp it even more? Like, should I do, I mean, this is, that's even better, right? That charged even faster. Is that better? What's the price that I paid for charging faster? It's well, it's stable. It's less stable, but that's okay. You're sort of there, though. It overshoots. You get this overshoot. You see this? See how you overshoot your system? Okay, that might not be bad. Like, maybe your battery, like you're, it's designed, like you're trying to charge it to 5 volts, let's say. In this overshoot system, it gets to 5.1 volts. Okay, maybe your battery can handle being charged to 5.1 volts for a, for, a, for a moment. That's a pretty good deal. As long as you don't cook your battery with the overshoot, you were able to charge it faster. All right? But at some point, right, if you remember how we, as we, as we were increasing our, uh, as we were decreasing zeta, these overshoots got bigger and bigger and bigger. At some point, you get so much overshoot, 
that you cook your battery. And it doesn't matter how fast you're charging it, right? You're still cooking the system. So underdamped systems are, are, are typically advantageous because they can reach their final value faster. But their disadvan the, the disadvantage is that you have to be able to tolerate some overshoot of your final value. All right? Um, whereas overdamp systems, they never overshoot, right? So they're, excuse me, they've got these like nice properties in terms of their ability to be very like slow and predictable and so on. What about the, um, what about the shock absorbers on your car? You think those are overdamped or underdamped? When you hit a bump, do you just go, <laughs> right? Or do you go, Doing, right? You bounce around. Well, you bounce around, right? Well, what's, what's bouncing around other than an underdamped system? Okay. Could they make an overdamped suspension? Totally. They just put in a stiffer spring, right? How would that feel as a ride? I don't know. Maybe kind of weird, right? You hit a bump and then like the whole car is like settles slowly. You know, you have this like nice slow thing as, as like the brakes settle. I, I, as, as the suspension settles, like I, I don't know. Maybe somebody's tried it. This might give you a smoother ride, but then what happens when you hit the next bump and you're not even done, you know, responding to the first bump? Okay, then maybe that's where it gets weird. So then you say, okay, well, maybe it's better to make the spring looser. Okay, if you hit make the spring looser, then when you hit the bump, instead of getting like one or two jiggles, you know, you're gonna jiggle for like a half hour as you go down the road waiting for that you know, waiting for that, that, that energy to dissipate. So, I mean, this is like real world engineering stuff, right? Sometimes you, you know, there's like a balance between how quickly you want the jiggle to dissipate and, you know, sometimes you, there may be applications where the no jiggle is acceptable, right? And then, then you've got to build the no jiggle system. Um, but, so it's the same thing with springs. I mean, we're, we're, over in mechanical engineering, they're learning the same equations, right? First and second order system dynamics are, uh, they're common to basically all engineering. So if you take resistors and capacitors and inductors and replace them with masses and springs and I don't know whatever the, 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 the analog of an inductor is, you get the same set of equations. So that they, they study the same things with, with uh, respect to that. So that's kind of like all of the second order system gathered up into, uh, into kind of one piece. Now, I've got 10 minutes of your time left and I intend to show you one more thing. I'm going to at least tease what we're going to be doing next. Uh, next. So we looked at the, uh, I don't think we did this in simulation. I know we did this on the board. Um, i got to wait for this thing to charge. Probably by the time that projector comes on, class will be over. All right, it's coming. I should have just muted it. I don't know why I turned it off. I should know better. Uh, searching for source. Okay. All right. Well, that wasn't so bad. Okay. So here's what we're gonna do. Um, let me go back to my. Let me go back to my list of circuits and pull up the. Um, remember this guy? <coughs> remember we we drew that on the board and that was our. Um, that was our first order system, and we learned about time constants. Have we already forgotten all that? No, it was cool, right? We learned about it. So, and uh, we briefly, briefly did some hand waving. It really was just so crude that you can only call it hand waving, where we talked about putting in different frequencies of sine waves. And we found that when you put in different frequencies of sine waves, what happened? Do you remember? What's that? Right. So if you put in, we said, very low frequency circuit sine waves, the capacitor open, and then V out V equal, equal V in. And we said for very high frequency coast, uh, inputs, the capacitor kind of shorted and V out shorted to ground. So we made this, I made this argument that this was sort of like a low pass filter. That if I change the frequency of my input signal, that I could affect the size of my output. All right. So what we're going to be doing over the next uh, basically like two or three weeks is we're going to be looking at the first order circuit and then the second order circuit and we're going to be passing in 
cosines of different frequencies and seeing what happens. So um, let's see if this is actually... Okay, so here, here's an example. So for this case, the orange signal is my input signal. The blue signal is my output signal. And what's interesting is that you can see that the, uh, the, orange sig the, 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 the blue signal is a little bit smaller at the output than it was at the input. Okay, now, for some reason it was set at 795.8 hertz. I'm going to make that frequency bigger. So instead of like 800 hertz, I'm going to make it, um, oh, I don't know, 2,000 hertz. And I'm going to run another simulation. How does the output size look relative to the input size? Is it smaller than it was before or bigger? Smaller. smaller. What do you think would happen if I made my frequency even bigger? So instead of a 2 kilohertz sine wave, let's put in a, uh, oh, I don't know, a 20 kilohertz sine wave. Wow! So, I'm showing you what you already know. I'm just kind of like reminding you about what you already know so that we can talk about it in, in more, in more uh, detail on Friday. So, what it looks like for this first order circuit is you increase the frequency of the, of the cosine that you input. It still looks like a cosine at the output, but it's smaller. So, I want to ask, answer two questions. The first question is, can we predict the size of the output cosine? Can we predict it? We're going to have to develop some new math to handle that. And the second question is, what does that have to do with the time constant? You remember we said that that circuit, it was a first order circuit, was completely defined by its time constant. If you, I said if you knew that, you knew everything. So how does the performance of this cosine have to do with the, with, the, with the time constant? Because I claim that that time constant is everything. So if I knew the time constant, could I have predicted what the size of this output signal will be? OK? And that's what we'll be doing. That'll eat like at least two lectures, maybe three. And then we'll do the same mess for second order circuits. And we'll see what does the output signal, the size of the output signal, have to do with zeta and omega naught, because it's all related. OK? All right. Thank you. I hope that was more, less confusing than it was, you know, intended to be.